This week on Quality Digest Live, employee loyalty builds great organizations, but only if the company is loyal in return. Mm -hmm. Plus, do you look at your suppliers as partners to be supported or cash cows to be milked? Boo. We'll find out when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for May 17th, 2013. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dr. Sharm, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest publisher Mike Richman. A timely article that we ran this week came to us from Knowledge of Wharton, the web-based research and business analysis journal from the Wharton School of Business. And if you haven't seen this resource before, check it out. There's always a lot of great information in there, and we, we use it a lot. We Absolutely. actually yep, good read, stuff. read Knowledge of Wharton all the time, so, so check that one out. This particular piece, titled Productivity in the Modern Office, ran in Tuesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. It addresses a topic that's very much in the news these days, worker productivity, especially in light of recent decisions from big companies such as Yahoo and Best Buy to bring off-site workers back into the office. The story that keeps on <laughs> giving. <laughs> oh, well, it's a, it's a big issue. And the heart of the issue uh, is in properly weighing the output of knowledge workers. Knowledge workers, those for whom productivity cannot be measured in terms of the numbers of widgets produced per shift. Uh, in fact, as the article points out, oftentimes organizations want knowledge workers to have less quantity of output and greater quality. For example, for those in customer service responsible for nurturing new business, perhaps the most valuable productive workers are having fewer but longer and more fruitful interactions with customers. Now, that's of course better than zillions of empty calls that fail to uncover and resolve issues and therefore don't develop long-term customers for the company or keep customers that are right. already and there that, for the company. And that's the problem when you have I'm not sure if it's the practice now, but it used to be your, your customer service representatives had to make X number, handle X number of calls sure. in a shift. Sure. So it's like, oh boy, I better rush this guy here because I gotta get on to the next you're, one. You're on a call for five minutes and, yeah, and you're, time to go. you're maybe <laughs> resolving it, maybe you're yeah. not, but you're working your way through it and all of a sudden you gotta go. So yeah. I mean, that, what's that gonna leave you with a customer who's unhappy, his or her right. problem wasn't solved. The key idea here is that blanket solutions don't work. In other words, if you're having problems with poor performing employees, you, you really want to address the issues with those employees individually rather than changing enterprise-wide protocols that maybe work just fine for the majority, like, like working from home, mm -hmm. for instance. These are important lessons for companies, and not just as it regards workers who are below average in terms of productivity. You need to be careful how you handle your most productive employees as well, because as the saying goes, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Well, that, that's great. That's great in the short term. But if you keep giving your best performers the hardest assignments, the article refers to this as the productivity punishment. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Productivity punishment. <laughs> if you keep giving them the, the toughest work, you're going to burn them out. They're going to leave. So really, it's better to raise everyone's game to something of an equal level, spread out the work, and ensure the highest possible productivity for your organization as a whole, whether they work from the home, the office, or in between, like Dirk at any number of... Coffee, coffee shop, shop in California. California. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, for more information on this article from Knowledge Warden and all, and Mark, all the stories we're going to be covering today on the show, check out the story links right below the video player right down there. That's right. And also, if you have any questions you want to send yes. us during the show, send them to QDL at qualitydigest.com and we will try to get them on the show. Dirk will be sure to interrupt me in the middle of the story. <laughs> right? With a question completely irrelevant <laughs> to what he's talking about. Okay, so talk about unintended consequences all smooshed together with innovation. Right. One of my favorite words from smooshed? somebody who works here. Smooshed. <laughs> MIT researcher Donald Sadaway, a John F. Elliott professor of materials chemistry at MIT, had received a grant from NASA to look for ways of producing oxygen on the moon, you know, for like, uh, for a future moon bases and sure. stuff. They don't want to take the oxygen there, they need to generate it. Okay. So Sadaway had found that a process called molten oxide electrolysis could use iron oxide from the lunar soil to make plenty of oxygen with no special chemistry. He tried this out using lunar-like soil from a meteor crater in Arizona, called Meteor Crater, oh. because it's a, Meteor crater. It contains iron oxide. Imagine that. Uh, big, big meteor crater. Contains iron oxide from an asteroid impact thousands of year, years ago. And it really it gave kind of the ideal testing ground for, for Sadaway to test out this process. Well, he tested out the process and he discovered that, hey, it not only created pure oxygen, it also created very pure steel. Interesting. So 
Let's backtrack a little, little bit. Keep in mind that worldwide steel production currently totals about 1.5 billion billion tons per year. The current process makes steel from iron ore, which is mostly iron oxide, by heating it with carbon. The main byproduct is carbon dioxide, or CO2, a greenhouse gas. One ton of steel generates almost two tons of CO2 emissions, according to steel industry figures. Steel production is one of the top five most CO2 intensive uh, industries uh, in the world. And we, we had actually talked about this before. There's a, a steel, aluminum, one, yeah. uh, paper, and I don't know, two others. Yeah, but, they're, but they're, you they're, talking, me talking. Yeah, right. that's, that's, they're, they're, all, they're all real wasteful. They're, they're, they all create a lot of CO2 emissions. Right. And so what's interesting about this. Um, th this research that the, the MIT researchers, uh, the process that the MIT researchers came up with, not only could make life more livable on the moon, it could also make life more livable on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and one other thing. Uh, th the process lends itself, this is the other kind of cool thing about it, lends itself to smaller steel production plants. Right now, uh, the, current, the current methods of uh, producing steel, really in order to be cost effective, you have to have these really giant uh, uh, steel production mm -hmm. plants. Mm -hmm. This pro uh, process, for whatever reason, actually lends itself to a scaled down version. So you could have smaller, maybe more regional steel production, which would obviously uh, cut down on shipping costs and, and that sort of stuff. So, mm -hmm. kind of interesting process overall, kind of one of those interesting little techie stories out of MIT that we get every now and then. So You, you know, it's like anything else in science. I mean, there, there's so many unintended consequences. When you, yeah. you, you want to research one thing, you find something else that springs from that, and maybe the thing that you found that sprung from it you didn't intend was actually a more of a benefit than the thing you initially were researching. I will say there was a comment on this article, and, and this guy really has it right. He says, well, how about just less steel production? Yeah, yeah. Because one, one thing that comes out of these, I mean, we could sidetrack on this forever. One thing that comes out of this research is you don't always necessarily know the other unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So this looks great. I mean, it's pure oxygen, pure steel, smaller plants. How bad could that be? Well, yeah, you never know until you ramp it up and find out that there's some something that you didn't uh, yeah, think of. Yeah, and right. so, yeah, really the making better uses of the resources you already have yep. probably makes a lot more sense. So. Okay. Thanks. Well, thanks, Dirk. Good. Yeah. Good. Those are our news items for the week. And let's turn now to our feature articles. And the first one is from Jack Dunnigan. Right. Jack Dunnigan. And Jack is talking about uh, something that's very important, near and dear to all of our hearts, loyalty. Personal and corporate loyalty is the name of the piece. And of course, that ran in Tuesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Jack Dunnigan. Jack is in the middle of a, actually, I think he's kind of early, it on here in a 16-part yeah, 16 16 series. 16-part series. 16 part series from Jack Dunning. And what he's talking about in the 16-part series really is what are the qualities that are shared by best-in-class employees? What are the qualities that you want to find in the people that you're going to hire to, to help your company, your organization move forward? And really the common theme is that you want you want team members, you want people that you're going to bring into your organization to help manifest the vision of that organization. Jack always kind of personalizes it. He says, I want people that can help me extend my reach and help me be more efficient in doing my job. And really, the me there really represents the organization. He wants the organization to be able to move forward by properly using its people. You know, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of resources in an organization. There's tools, there's techniques, there's methodologies, but really the most important one is the people. I think in any organization, right. really what moves the needle, really what makes a good organization great uh, is, is, is the people and how you manage your people and how you motivate your people and how you, you help them to be who they can be so they can help your organization be what it can be. So how does loyalty fit in there? Okay, Really, what, what, why is he talking about loyalty here? Well, because employees need to, uh, he says this and I agree with this, employees need to align their personal agendas and vision with the vision of the organization in order for, again, all the sales to be pointed in the right direction sure. and, and to go where, where management directs the company to go, employees need to be loyal. Now, that doesn't mean that the employees are going to be yes men or yes women, as the case may be. It doesn't mean you're going to just, just say yes to everything and you're going to, to be in agreement with things that you may think are wrong. Now, all of us working in our individual fields and in our individual work know when things are right and we know when things are wrong. And it's our responsibility to kind of push that up, up forward a little bit, push that to management. If, if we say that things are not really going well, we need to have the courage to push that forward and say, hey, you know, I think there's a, there's a break here in the system somewhere. Um, and if you don't do that, if you are a yes man, uh, that's actually very disloyal. Because really, you may be helping yourself, you may think you'd be helping yourself because people like you and they want to work with you and they want to give you promotions and raises, right. but 
what are you ultimately doing? If you're just yesing the, the problem to death, you're not improving anything, right? If you're not improving the situation, you're not helping the company, you're really not being loyal to what the real purpose of the organization is. Uh, so I think the point here, what Jack gets to at the end of this piece, is that loyalty primarily is a two-way street. Again, employees have responsibilities. Workers have, have responsibilities to, to push that forward to management. Management has some responsibilities too. And, and honesty is a big part of this. Again, <clears throat> workers have to say if they think a process is wrong. Management needs to take the responsibility to, to kind of hold workers to, to task too and say, hey, you need to do this better. We need to tell you the truth. We all need to tell each other the truth within this. That's how we, we have loyalty really be a two-way street. Um, and I think that, that, that that's an important thing. And I think sometimes that's lost is, is the idea that loyalty maybe just goes one way is, is right. the common thought here, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We know that. We've all seen that in our, in our own, our own uh, work, work lives. Right. I mean, I, I guess when I, when I think of, when I think of, of loyalty, and I, I can't remember whether he touched on this aspect or not, Loyal, I mean, loyalty from, from management toward, toward employees yeah. is that ability to, uh, to listen and support their ideas. I mean, it, you may not agree with the ideas, sure. but the idea that, that you at least consider them. In other words, uh, uh, just because it doesn't seem to align with your idea um, of, of the way things should work, doesn't mean you immediately dismiss it. I mean, you really have to, if you're going to be loyal to your employees, you've got to take their ideas and suggestions to heart. You may dismiss them later, but you've got to at least consider them and think about them. And that's really, I mean, it's hard for me. I mean, I, sure. I have ideas in my head, things should be certain. I mean, Ryan and I just had a big old discussion this morning. We were completely disagreeing on stuff. But I mean, it's, it's like, I got to stop and go, wait a minute. Okay, what, what's he actually saying? Does it make sense? Kind of put my own ideas aside. Uh -huh. Is there, valid, is there value in it? And of course, it's coming from Ryan, so there's no value in it. So. <laughs> but the, the phrase you're looking for here is fair hearing. You want to have yeah. a fair hearing of those ideas. Yeah. You, want to, you want to raise them, you want to look at them, and you want to analyze them. But that being said, I know we have to wrap it up because you got, you got an interesting article too yeah. we want to cover. But that being said, managers still have to manage. The command and control of the organization really needs to come from the top down. And, right. and I think that, that if you get away from that, and that Jack's not saying that, that you want to get away from that, and right. I'm not saying that either. You, 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 know, you have to give that fair hearing, you have to weigh those things that people are telling you so that they remain loyal and you're loyal to them, but ultimately managers are the one that decide right. where the organization is going to go because it doesn't work, you have chaos right. if you don't do it that way. So yeah. good, good piece from Jack, yeah. Jack Dunnigan. Check out the series. He's right in the middle of it. He's got another, what, I think, 13 We, we, we need, we need to, We were talking about the story. We, we need to get Jack on the show. Because, uh, my feeling is he's just this down-to-earth guy. Yeah. I, believe he, I believe he runs a, uh, some sort of maybe a cabinet shop or, yeah. or something like that, something with wood. That's, that's my feeling of it. And I think this is a guy who's just been dealing with management issues for his entire working yeah. life and decided to start write, writing about it. And he's got some really good yeah. common yeah. sense we're, stuff. We're, we're glad he did yeah. because it is good stuff. So check out the series. Uh, He's right in the middle. We've got another couple of months to go of, of Jack talking about what, what makes good employees really work for your organization. So That's check right. That out. Okay. So, the following is an opinion. <laughs> Dirk's opinion. The views about to be expressed do not necessarily Dirk's represent the opinions by quality, quality Digest and their advertisers. Or, or me, or anybody. Of course, who, if you disagree with me, you're completely wrong. Okay. <laughs> this is an amazing story. In a ridiculous, greed-headed that's my opinion. Greed Appro headed? Greed headed approach okay. to free up money at the expense of suppliers. Companies like JCPenney, DuPont, Procter & Gamble are pressuring their suppliers to accept longer payment terms. So, you know, net 30 or 45 days, we're used to that, we're, we're used to that right? Mm -hmm. That's what well, we probably do net 30 with our, with our customers, right? Yeah, Something like yeah, that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, forget about it. Forget about it. We're talking about net 75, net 90, net 100, net 120, four months out. Can you imagine if you sold something to an advertiser and they say, Mike, that's awesome. We're so glad to work with you guys. We'll pay you in four months. Yeah, it's, it's a cash flow issue. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, yeah. <laughs> Like, sure, guys, no problem. Well, you want the orders. That's the thing is, you know, what, what you're getting to, I know you're going to get to this, is, is you're talking about big companies and much smaller, in many cases, suppliers. Exactly. And, and we will get to that. Yeah. So the article I'm talking about here uh, is by um, Kevin Meyer. It's entitled Net Nonsense. It's in this Thursday's Quality Digest Daily. Uh, in that article, there's also a link to a great Wall Street Journal article by Serena Ng called P&G 
Procter & Gamble, big companies pinch suppliers on payments. And like I said, there's a link to it in Meyer's story. And also in the Wall Street Journal story, there's an embedded video that you absolutely have to watch. So read Meyer's story, read the Wall Street Journal story, read the, uh, re uh, watch, watch the video and be prepared to gnash your teeth. And, and, um, and write us a report on it. And write us a report on it if you don't mind. Okay, <laughs> so in the video, actually, according to Paul uh, Ziobro, a consumer products reporter speaking to MoneyBeat, by lengthening, by lengthening the amount of time it takes to pay its suppliers, Procter & Gamble could free up as much as $2 billion in cash, money that P&G could use to fund investments in new factories overseas or to help pay for stock buybacks. Um, so, what about the suppliers? So P&G wants to expend, extend their, their uh, I believe P&G said they wanted to get an average, they're at 45 right now, I believe they said they wanted to get an average of a 100 day, mm -hmm. right? So what happens to the supplier? What happens to the small supplier that now has maybe a cash shortfall? No problem, they've got a brilliant plan. P&G, DuPont, Pennies, these guys will work with your bank to give you a short term loan. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? They'll work, I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? They'll go to the bank. They can show the bank, look, you know, the, here's the invoice from Quality Digest or whatever. Uh, you can see we're going to be paying them in 120 days. Um, <laughs> and they're having a little cash problem. You know, work with them. And for the bank, it's a no-brainer. They can see the invoice. They sure. can see, the, you know, P&G. They trust they're going to pay, right? Sure. So for the bank, it's a, bank, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Of course, now the bank's going to take 3 or 4% yeah. on that short-term loan. Well, you right? know, it's funny because I have an Uncle Nino. <laughs> yes. He does something very similar to that. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, there's some knuckles. Yeah. Are involved yeah, uh, times, Uncle Nino. Uh, yeah, 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 Uncle Guido. So, so this is the way it works, right? So th this is how it works. <laughs> Procter & Gamble gets an extra couple billion in spare cash to spend on making a few billion dollars more. Sure, the bank makes three or four percent on that short-term low, and hey, the supplier, they get to have a customer like Procter & Gamble, DuPont, or Pennies who has them over a barrel. Yeah. Awesome! <laughs> <laughs> Something's a little wrong. Take here. out a loan. <laughs> take out a loan <laughs> for your receivables. Make the customer take out a loan for the money that they owe you. Yeah, for your receivables. Uh, for yeah. your receivables. Yeah, that makes that's like oh, that's perfect this sense. Is yeah, brilliant. Yeah, this is brilliant. We're in the wrong business for sure. <laughs> and look, <laughs> we're picking on Procter and Gamble here, but in the Wall Street Journal article, it isn't just P and G. It's Pennies, it's East Tech International, I believe they're a medical supplies uh, uh, company, mm -hmm. uh, Kimberly Clark, uh, Church and Dwight, Newell Rubbermaid, and, and DuPont. These guys are all looking to extend their, uh, their payment Why periods, not? It's right? A great, it's a great plan. It's a great plan. And, but, I mean, look, you've got to feel for them a little bit. You've got to feel for them a little bit. Um, there is a reason. This isn't just willy-nilly. They're not just, like, pulling this out their rear end. I mean, there's actually a reason for this. And, okay, uh, I've got a quote here. This is from... Uh, Nick Fanandakis, Chief Financial Officer for DuPont, who said, makes sense, you don't want to have excess cash tied up in the company that's not generating any value. Well, Nick, yeah, man, I can see how having excess cash would really suck. <laughs> Well, what about you know what sucks more? <laughs> Being the supplier, that's <laughs> not having any cash. <laughs> that's the po but you position have a loan. you're putting. But you, you have, have a loan. loan. I can get a loan. No problem. Hey, right. I got an idea. I know what they can do with this excess cash. Hey, how about paying your suppliers in a timely manner? <laughs> how about contributing to the American economy? Think about this. DuPont, Penny, East Tech. Think about this. 95% of American businesses are small businesses. That means the people that you are, are your suppliers most likely are companies the size of Quality Digest or a little bit bigger. 20 employees are less. Those are the people that you've got over a barrel. Those are the ones you're saying to be your personal bank so that you can spend your money elsewhere. How about supplying the American people uh, a, a real value in paying your bills on time and in a fashion in, in a timely manner. what you're doing honestly uh, it may be legal obviously legal but it is unethical there is absolutely no integrity in it and furthermore it's hypocritical let me show you why Chris put up that first slide this is from JCPenney's supplier principles this is right from the JCPenney website at JCPenney 
We commit ourselves to the values expressed in our statement of business ethics, which is derived from the belief of our founder, James Cash Penny, in doing business according to the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The J.C. Penny Statement of Business eth Ethics sets out the standards by which all J.C. Penney's associates promote a culture of integrity and legal compliance, including guidance on relations and interactions with suppliers. Next slide. From DuPont, our mission, vision, and values. This is excerpted from that. Safety, concern, and care for our people. Protect, protection of the environment and personal and corporate integrity are this company's highest values, and we will not compromise them. Next slide. From Procter & Gamble, purpose, values, principles. We develop close, mutually productive relationships with our customers and our suppliers. We build superior relationships with all the parties who contribute to fulfilling our corporate purpose, including our customers, suppliers, universities, and governments. The key word throughout all of those, integrity. Guess what? There ain't no integrity in that. Well, you know, Derek, I, I, I think that you're, you're, you're laying out an issue here and you're being, you're being pretty hard on some of these companies. <laughs> Sorry? But that's okay. I, I think that... that but you, I mean, I mean you, cash flow is a big deal. Cash flow is a big deal. And, and I mean, certainly cash flow for small companies is a huge deal. And, and, and what you're saying here is, is this is very much a David and Goliath thing. What, what Kevin Meyer is saying in his article is, is that these huge companies are looking at their suppliers as banks. And the reason why they're doing it is because they can uh, yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. if you have an order from a, from a big company like that, they probably, in most cases, these companies that are doing this to their suppliers are those suppliers' biggest customers. I, I, I would say almost, almost in every case, probably that's the case. Right, right. And what choice do you have? I mean, you can't lose the business. Glad you asked that. Yeah. What choice do you have? You can lose business. If, if you're able to do it, um, just happen to have up here, uh, executives at Federal Mogul, a supplier of automotive spare parts to wholesale and retail distributors, told analysts on a conference call in February that they don't intend to continue extending payment terms in the future. Quote, if we need to lose market share because of our terms, I'm willing to concede business if we cannot continue to operate on the margins or the terms that are reasonable for our organization. That was from Mike uh, Broderick, Federal Mogul's uh, CEO. So there you go. That is an option. I mean, my feeling is if, if you have, a, if you have a, a, a customer who is trying to extend terms beyond what you think is reasonable mm -hmm. and you are in the position to be able to do it, I say bye-bye. Yeah. I mean, that's the only way there's going to be pushback. Uh, and there are, it wasn't just federal mogul. There's others who are saying yeah. the same things going like, oh, okay, wait a minute, this is getting ridiculous. I mean, come on. Well, you know, the supplier-customer relationship it does not have to be an adversarial one. Uh, right. But sometimes it maybe does have to be a little bit on the, on the edge of that where you need to stand up for what you need for your organization. As, as the, the chair, the CEO of Federal Mogul said there, you yeah. know, we're going to do what's best for our, our organization. And each organization needs to determine that for themselves, what is right for them. And, and to push back is, it's the only way it is going to change, yeah. right, is if yeah. there's pushback on that level. Really interesting story. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Really, good. really good, interesting good story. Read. You there. Good, go good read those. Read. Yeah, read yeah. and read. Read all the the, the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> yeah, Wall Street Journal. And watch uh, the video. There it was great. Uh, read that yeah, video. Watch yeah. that video and check that's that out. Uh, and again, you can access that right down there, right through the player page, uh, bottom of our player page. There, the article is, is right down there. So, yep. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin Meyer. Thanks, Dirk, for that. Sure. Great, that's great piece. Okay. Well, we're going to go now to uh, to our our last feature of the day of, of QDL, and and we're joined now by an in-studio guest, Mike Micklewright. Mike Micklewright is uh, a longtime contributor of Quality Digest Daily, um, and, and Mike and, and Quality Digest have worked together for, uh, for a long time on a lot of things. That, and lately what we've been working on, Mike, as you well know, is uh, our latest series, uh, our latest video training series on, on what's known as BMS, yes. Business Management System. So you're down here this week, coming up this week, to, to do some more taping on the series. Why don't you tell all of us out here, all of our audience, um, what's BMS? What is BMS all about and, and how does it connect in and integrate with like Lean, for instance? Okay, good. Yeah, um, in fact, uh, I'm thinking about taking up residency in California. You are. Every so often. So, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, a, a BMS is a business management system and, and of course we're all familiar with a quality management system. And, um, uh, but this has to go beyond because Lean needs a management system too as well. It does need a management system to bring it all together, tie it all together. Uh, but then if you're into Six Sigma, Six, Six Sigma needs a management system. Environmental, you need an environmental management system. You know, what you really need is something to group it all together, to integrate it all together. Otherwise, there's just a lot of waste otherwise. So 
you know, it's ironic because you think about it, all these systems, everything really, the heart of it is about driving out waste, increasing efficiency and quality for the organization. Yet the proliferation of all these systems and that, that aren't under one roof creates what? A lot more waste, right? It, especially when you talk about lean and quality. Yeah. There's so much overlapping there. They have the same intent. Yeah. I mean, it's to improve, improve processes, improve our products. Um, but you have the lean group and you have the quality group and they're going at it in different directions and different ways and they're, sometimes they're even fighting for resources, which is, again, wasteful and crazy. It's crazy. And not, yeah. not just in real big organizations either. No. This is in some small organizations Absolutely. too that, that you think you're like, well, just walk down the hall and just kind of get it together, guys, right? right. I mean, but it doesn't happen that way sometimes. Exactly. So, so the, the video series that we're doing is, is, is bringing and showing how to bring it all together, how yep. we can treat it all as one system and drive out the waste and also to help sustain your improvements. That's great. Yeah. And we're, shoot, we're shooting more episodes of that series this week coming up. We yep. shot a lot in the can already and we can all be on the lookout for that coming up real real, real soon here down right. later yeah. on in the middle part of the year. Well, you know, Mike, the other thing that, that we had with you this last week was uh, one of our real popular articles uh, on a topic that I know you're very passionate about. Uh, the name of the article was, uh, was, I believe, was Ruthless Sorting. But now, it really wasn't ruthless sorting. There was another R involved and a couple of other R's involved in that that maybe you can address for us. Yes, I, I, I've kind of gained a reputation as being a ruthless <laughs> sorter, so I thought, well, let me write about this and also clarify some things. I kind of like the word ruthless in the beginning, but then I looked up the definition yeah. and uh, it's without compassion or pity. And it's like, no, no, that's not me. That's not the way I really sort. Uh, I do have compassion. I do have pity. I have respect. So that's one of the other R words. So, so when I talk about sorting, we talk about the three R's of sorting. And I think the word that people really want to uh, tag me with instead of ruthless is, is relentless. Mm -hmm. And I am definitely relentless when I go out and I sort and I help organizations to sort. So it's relentless and it's resolute and it's respectful. Those are the three R's that are so important in a good sorting process and starting off the entire 5S process in a, in a good direction. And that, and that is, that is the first S in 5S, correct, is sorting? Is Absolutely, correct, right? sorting is, yes. So and that really, what you're saying here is that you need to first go into the organization and, and, and kind of roll up your sleeves a little bit, look at the process and begin to, to not, maybe not even physically sort sometimes, and maybe sometimes you need to physically sort, but, but sort out the different various elements that feed into those processes, right? And then begin to, to, to untangle what may be a little bit of a, sometimes a complicated process, is that correct? Yes, and, and, and I do get my, my hands dirty. I mean, I'm, I'm, on, I'm underneath the, uh, the cabinets and, and reaching for stuff, and I, I mean, I, I, I'm just everywhere, all over the place, because I want to set an example. Mm -hmm. it's everything, we look at everything. We're not just looking at the big picture, we're looking at everything. And, uh, and yes, our, our areas, our, our, our minds, <laughs> our, our processes are cluttered with stuff. And the problem, of course, is that it, 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 it prevents us from doing a good quality job. So the whole idea of 5S and then starting off with a good first S, good sorting, um, is to really minimize operator error. I mean, we in the quality world, we always say, hey, we can't blame people. We need to blame the system. Well, a lot of it's because uh, we have bad systems, we have bad organizations, and, 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 and so 5S is, is, is there to, to help us clean out that clutter. And, and so that we can just focus in on the tools and the equipment and the paperwork or whatever it is that we only need and it's right there where we need it. Mm -hmm. First well, step though is a real good sort. Sort. Well, I yes. mean, we've all been there. I mean, I've seen it myself where you've, you've gone to shops where, where it's very well organized and everything's very visual and that's great. It, it, you almost breathe better when you're in a shop like that as opposed to a shop where stuff's all over the, the place and you can't find anything and there's no shadow board. I mean, there's nothing there that helps you Mentally, I mean, some people call it feng shui almost. I mean, <laughs> mentally, get in a space where you're ready to do productive work, right? I mean, so sorting really is the, the, the key to, to, to starting that, right? Yeah, I mean, it absolutely yeah. is, yeah. yes. And, and you have to focus. And, you know, perhaps some, re you know, one of the reasons I might be so relentless or, and, and teach others to be relentless, because it's all about teaching. I mean, you know, as soon as you, as soon as we go into a facility, um, the reason we get out of the classroom as soon as possible and onto the floor or the office area or whatever it might be, is because it's hands-on teaching. Mm -hmm. And you need to che teach them the right way and you need to be relentless, constantly relentless, constantly asking questions, constantly driving people. And you might have 10, 20 people around uh, at the same time and you want to keep them all busy. So it's fast-paced, <laughs> it has to be fast-paced, active, constantly moving and relentless. Yeah, I hear but you. also respectful, respectful to the people. That's In right. other words, don't get into the personal space. Mm -hmm. Be very careful about that because this is something that they're going to be uncomfortable with in the beginning. Yeah. In the end, they thank you. Yeah, it's all a human interaction like anything else. Yes, in this it is. Of ours. Yeah. Great. All right, well, check that out. That article, again, is Ruthless Sorting. It's really not ruthless. It's really relentless, as Mike <laughs> indicated. Uh, you can check it out. Actually, uh, I don't know, Dirk, if we have that on the player page below there, but it's definitely on the Quality Dodgers homepage. You can check that out and, and read all about it. And, and definitely, again, look out for, for more from Mike. We're going to be shooting this week, and we're going to have a great video series for you. 
ready to, to help you train on this topic uh, very soon in the coming weeks and months. So look out for that. Okay. Well, now, uh, next week in, in Quality Digest, uh, in addition to Mike McElroy being here to help us uh, with BMS and, and doing uh, a lot of great taping we have, a really interesting uh, item that we're doing, uh, World Metrology Week. World Metrology Week is that week. World Metrology Week, act, World Metrology Day, actually, right. is Monday the 20th okay. of May. And we do a World Metrology Week. We're doing World Metrology Week with our good partners right back there, CMSC, Coordinate Metrology like Systems bigger. Conference. Bigger and better every year, that's right. It's, uh, it's going to be a lot of interesting content. If you are in the, in the portable coordinate 3D metrology space, you're going to want to check us out because there's a lot of good content coming up. There's some games and contests. You can win some great prizes. You can win some great prizes. Yeah. So, so be on the lookout for that starting on Monday here in Quality Digest Daily, World Metrology Week. A lot of that's good, good right. content. And also, next week on Thursday, uh, uh, the next episode of Gauging Quality on May 23rd. Again, on the care and feeding of hand gauges. You can see it right there on your screen. May 23rd, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Craig Howell and myself, uh, mostly Craig. I'll just stand there and look intelligent. Pretty. Uh, we'll be, uh, <laughs> or, or intelligent, <laughs> or neither. Um, We'll be talking about just how to take care of gauges, things that you can do with your hand gauges uh, that maybe you didn't know you could do, or uh, maybe just give you a little primer on it, things that you don't necessarily have to go to a calibration lab for. So uh, that'll be next week on Thursday, so be sure to check in for that. That's right. Um, so I guess we're done for today. That's, that's yep. the show. Thank you all for, thank you, Mike McElroy, for joining us in, in the studio. Uh, Kevin Meyer, great article. Jack Dunnigan, great article. Uh, next week, a lot of great content coming at you as well, and uh, some really cool stuff on next, next Friday's QDL as well, so That's right. look out for that. Okay, well, you guys have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. See ya.